Today, we have with us a guest, Professor Jagdish N. Shet, who is a renowned scholar and internationally recognized thought leader. He is a recipient of the 2020 Padma Bhushan Award for Literature and Education. Professor Shet has over 50 years of experience in teaching and research. He is globally known for his scholarly contributions in consumer behavior, relationship marketing, competitive strategy and geopolitical analysis. Professor Shade is a Charles H. Karlstedt Professor of Business in Guizueta Business School of Emory University. Let's embark on this captivating discussion alongside Professor Jagdish Shade. Thank you for inviting me. There are three power skills that are very critical as we go in the future to counterbalance or to add actually the hard skills. We teach our students as well as faculty and the staff, everybody, a lot of hard skills because there is an engineering mindset, the industrial age mindset, whatever it is. The three soft skills, first one, most critical one is compassion. The managers have to learn to be compassionate about everybody else. Usually, otherwise, you have a very interesting divide between the management and the staff, for example. Compassion is becoming very critical for leadership. So one has to, and compassion can be taught. People think it's like a natural trait, but I strongly believe one can have a skill in how to become compassionate. Second one is much more interesting in the sense that it happened during COVID. Do we have the resilience? Can we improvise? Can we adapt on the spot? And how can we scramble? Most universities did that. Certainly there were no classrooms in the middle of the semester. All of us were taught very quickly how to go online, for example. It happened in corporations because they were basically sheltered in place or they had basically banned in travel of any kind. And I think we all learned very quickly, the human species is very capable of adaptation to a change, improvisation. And I must tell you, I'm very proud being an Indian because I think in India, we know how to improvise every day. Things happen. So I think improvisation becomes a very valuable trait going forward for future leaders and management. And a third one, which is where we need to improve significantly, is that while the world is having conflict and you know competition, we need to learn how to collaborate. And one way to collaborate is teamwork. More than in this, semi-virtual world or physical and virtual world together, physical digital as we call it, something like that. I think it's very important to learn how to do teamwork in a remote way, as well as teamwork in person. Body language gives quite a lot. So when you just talk on the video, like a Zoom call, you only get two senses, voice and video. The other senses, touch, feel, etc., which comes only in physical contact. They're all signals we are giving to each other, whether we are cooperating or not cooperating in a teamwork. There's a passive assistance quite often. I think one has to learn those body languages and train accordingly. How do you work in a teamwork? And if you're a team leader, how do you sense there's a passive assistance? So those are the three skill sets I think are very important going forward in addition to hard, hard skills. There are two or three different tactics that can be deployed in a classroom setting, for example. One is basically experiential learning is very critical for soft skills. Soft skills cannot be taught just by textbooks. You have to experience it. And therefore, experiential learning becomes very critical as a component. And one can do that by immersing them into, in them into situations. Compassion, for example. Can they go out into the rural economy can they go out to the slum areas? Can they go out to the villages in general and experience what the reality is all about? So to me, experiential learning becomes a very important component of becoming compassionate. You put yourself in the community of others rather than just the shoes of others. I think that's very key learning method. Second learning method is surprisingly scenario building. One can do scenarios saying that here is a scenario for the future, something happening and as an episode, 
how would you encounter, how would you manage, how would you cope with it. I think scenario planning, scenario creation is a very skill set, again, which some people do very, very well. Mm -hmm. And so you, you can test students from that viewpoint. Are they able to answer in the right way what, what we are looking for? It's like a case method. Fortunately, with the digital platforms, I can individualize, personalize quite a lot. So learning can be highly personalized, individualized. Learning can be made very interactive, for example, and learning can be, in fact, very integrated. So there's nothing like soft skills only or among soft skills. I can have soft skills blended with hard skills also. All of that is a great opportunity in the digital world. So that's the second major approach that I recommend. Third one is um, somewhat more difficult, which is to say, how can I experience the real world by traveling? You learn so much when you travel. And there's a very famous Asian saying, when the student is ready, the teacher will show up. We says, do you have a learning attitude where you're constantly saying, can I learn from anybody? Does not have to be my peers. Does not have to be, in fact, some, some, some well-known personality, uh, but can be, in fact, from mountains. Can be from nature. If you just observe it, how do you immerse yourself into the physical world and observe? Observe and say, what does this mean? There's a reason why there's a systematic ecosystem out there. And what, what does that ecosystem tell us? I think that's a very interesting way of learning, in my view. So those are the three, four mechanisms that one can create to learn the soft skills. The three that we talked about, empathy, improvisation, and teamwork. I find that we have underestimated the potential of human beings. So if you take a grain of wheat and make it into a loaf of bread, you know, loaf of bread, the value value is only three times. If you take a rough diamond and polish it, a good diamond cutter will get the brilliance out and the economic value, if not social value, is about 15 to 20 times. But you take a human being, mentor, polish, educate, value add is infinite. And that's the role of a corporation. How do I make my employees from ordinary to extraordinary? The new style of management is not about I'm a boss. Boss is a dirty word, actually. I'm a mentor and a leader. I'm a coach. My objective as a leader of the organization or a leader of a team is to get your excellence out, just as we do in sports. You don't remember the coach, but you remember the player. Whether it's a cricket in India, for example, or the FIFA 2022, for example, in Doha, or American football, makes no difference. We remember the athlete, not necessarily the coach. And that's a very difficult job for a manager to understand. Because they, they are thinking about their own career. But really, uh, the best way to retain good employees, get more potential out of them, would be to think about as excellent players, rough diamonds, and I need to learn the skill set to polish them in a way where their brilliance shows and their brilliance reflects the brilliance of the corporation. You know, the best marketers are internal marketers. Because you cannot sell anything or you cannot brand anything till the organization is cooperating with you. So I always said, said that don't do external marketing first before you've done internal marketing. Which you know, working at top corporations, that's the skill set you learn on the job, <laughs> if not by training. So how can we train people to be internal marketers it becomes a very important skill set. Because that basically says that other organ other leaders in functional teams or product teams or geographic teams have to cooperate and collaborate with you. And therefore, having them comfort factor, trusting you. Just taking customer advocacy is not enough. But the customer advocacy can be heard with empathy, sympathy, etc. by each of the functional heads or geographic heads, especially I find for a multinational corporation, 
it's so difficult to convince a country manager in charge of the region because he or she thinks I know my politics and I know my culture, etc. You are a distant corporate headquarters and therefore you probably have no idea how complex the situation is. You need to convince them. So internal marketing is very important, which we don't teach, unfortunately. I think it's a very insightful question. We are all struggling. The traditional way we got educated, we have a good textbook writer who knows how to compile different disciplines and ideas into a readable book from a student perspective, not necessarily the professor perspective. Fundamentally, I think from text based, more and more there'll be video textbooks. And how do you learn through video as a mechanism as opposed to alphanumerical mechanism or you know, literacy tree? The three R's of learning are shifting to three A's of learning. Reading, writing, arithmetic is now becoming more, as I mentioned earlier, learning is more interactive. So how do you learn on an interactive basis? Which is a skill set usually Asian students don't have. So they're not encouraged in early childhood primary school, secondary uh, schools to interact with the, with the professor or with the student teacher. So interaction is very key, learning to interact, that it, that it is. The second one is learning has to be integrated. There is something in common between math and music, which is a language. It's not like the left brain, right brain, you need both brains. So math, people say you are STEM major or you are some other major like a fine arts or liberal arts. I think we have created silos unnecessarily. So one has to rise to a meta level and say there is some sort of a learning that is integrated. There's something common between, as I said, math and music, math and chemistry or physics and chemistry, etc. I think that's a second major thing. And third one, learning has to be individual. All students are not at the same pace of learning. So how can we make learning through technology much more personalized? You may have a slow learner, you may have a fast learner, you know, pretty much so. But I still want to mention that despite everything we talk about negatively about Indian education, I'm still very grateful. It gave me a foundation. Our engineers are well trained. Our liberal arts faculty are well trained, our students are well trained, our management students are well trained. I think we should not look negatively, but say how can we polish it even more, especially with the use of technology. I'm very, very, very grateful that I got education free, which is unthinkable. So I think how do we manage learning as an enabler to get more potential out? And I also believe last comment I will make Learning should not be just for occupational skill development, employability. It should be employability and societally useful citizen. So we have to make sure that we combine the two from a learning viewpoint and the student understands that as they become good citizens of the society, they have an obligation to give back to the society. The society and the individual are two peas in a pod. A corporation and the ecosystem, the environment in the same way, community by and large. And I feel very strongly about that. And I wrote an article out of sheer frustration, business of business is more than business. It always was. Till in the 80s, private equity people took over large corporations, broke them all down and focused only on share of value. Some of the best companies are always in small town headquarters where the family has to go to church every Sunday. Church is a great equalizer. Their managers are their neighbors. Their children will play with your children. They go to the same school, there's only one school. That culture unfortunately gave way eventually where the family moved to large cities. Armank is a small town. New York is a big city, which is for IBM. Scanatity for you know, General Electric. That's their roots are, need to go back to roots. Even today, Whirlpool is in Benton Harbor, Michigan. Caterpillar is in Peoria, Illinois. 
That's the grassroots. Industrial revolution began in those small towns in England. Coventry was one of those, for example. Birmingham, I can give you names. German revolution was the same thing, small towns. But once the family or the corporation moved to a large city in access to, I have access to the capital, they became only investor oriented. So they are every day next to you. They forgot the suppliers, they forgot the community, they forgot the customers, and often they forgot the employees. So how do you bring back the old culture, which is still very prevalent in small town headquarter companies or privately held companies, you know, where the majority share, shareholding is based by the family, pretty much. And families taught the value, like monarchy used to do. To be a good monarch, you know, we go through a training program. I think that's very much needed. Otherwise, capitalism is at risk itself. Clearly, digital literacy. Leaders are way behind in understanding technology itself. But more importantly, its impact on human beings, on markets, whether it's internal employees or external customers or suppliers for that matter, and the community at large. World is moving on. And we all feel lagging behind. Half-life of knowledge is uh, getting so reduced. It's less than one and a half years in software, for example. I think in management area, it is almost only one and a half years. I did not know anything about blockchain, for example. I did not know anything about uh, AI and MI right now we are playing. I'm reading up myself on quantum computing, which is a totally a disruptive technology from a computing viewpoint. I think we have to constantly take time out to see how can I learn those skills on my own. Fortunately, you do have platforms like your platform, Pearson Learning, for example, and others. There's a good content out there. You just have to say, like exercise and diet, I must do it. Just for my own survival and growth. That's clearly one message I would strongly recommend. Uh, second message is, again, leading by wandering around. I think I find very fascinating that executives, senior executives in a corporation are more on the ivory tower than faculty members because everybody comes to their office. It's very important that you go to where the people are, where not only just customers, but suppliers, community, etc. That will make you learn so much and not only you'll be more accepted in the process, because they are showing that I'm not the boss boss kind of a thing. And especially at the chairman level and the managing director level, it is much more important. Employees, you know, several hierarchical levels and you, you are approachable. I can feel and think those are very important skills. That's a tough one because it may be more than one. But if I had to do that is, uh, resiliency, taking your inner survival strengths and making it into something that you transform yourself in the process. Every adversity builds a strong character if you survive. I'm a refugee from Burma, for example, before World War II, went through hardships and I survived. Because of that, I have an inner moral strength, a character which drives me more than anything else. So how do you build that inner character? And you can do through meditation, traditional approaches that we have done, which is very good. You can do through prayers, for example, whatever it is. Prayers are not meant for God, it's meant for you. Or you can do it, in fact, for, as I said, getting into situations which are unfamiliar. Learn the survival skills, such. So we believe managers especially should be rotating intentionally to say, all my life, I don't want to be just a marketer, branding, etc. I want to be a supply chain manager, or I want to be operations, I want to be finance. And that's interesting, and we all do it. The interesting part is that human the, the, the entities is so capable of versatility. So how do you become more versatile becomes very key. And that's why the Indian CEO, I mean, the multinational corporation CEOs are more of Indian origin because that's a, that's a part of survival game in India. You learn how to improvise, how to adapt, how to adapt constantly. So versatility on the one hand, 
and improvisation on the other hand we used to call jugad at one time right in a sort of a negative way but jugad in a positive way is very important for survival and, and then growth basically The one trend is clearly it's digitization of the world at a mass scale level. Digital technology is not elitist, unlike industrial age technologies, electromechanical, mechanical, and appliances were very expensive. Today, a cell phone is a lot smarter than any appliance that I can figure out. And you can see very clearly the power it is in the hands of the most illiterate people. But to me, a digital transformation and understanding how digital transformation will impact the life. We are all living like roommate family. Everybody rushes to the dinner very quickly like it's a chore. Then somebody's on YouTube, somebody's doing some coursework, somebody's talking on text messaging on, on, on WhatsApp, for example, somebody's talking on the phone. We live, live like roommates in the same room even. I find in a flat or an apartment, People live like that. I have grandchildren who are sitting next to each other, text messaging to each other rather than talking to each other. I think that roommate nation sees the rise. We need to understand how to cope and manage it. So one trend is impact of digital technology, social media, uh, etc., etc., whatever they are. We have to be really cognizant of that, conscious. Second major is really the rise of the new geopolitics. There's a new triad power. If you take the purchasing power parity measure, China is already number one now as an economy. The US is two, we are number three. So our, for India, it's about $11.5 trillion economy. Growing faster than the first two actually, will surpass US it looks like very clearly. So in this triad power, there is a, each one comes with a different background. Uh, Chinese have the communist legacy, for example. We have the mixed economy and sort of, we don't trust capitalism actually, as, as a country, as a society, which is why we put the knowledge worker or priest, for example, more important than a merchant, which is the reality. I mean, and then the Europeans have their own legacy. America has its own. America is what I call raw capitalism, cowboy capitalism. Trust the free market till it fails, then I intervene. See? Very interesting. So these three economies with different views will have to learn to coexist first of all, collaborate second of all if possible. There are issues that are global such as COVID pandemic has clearly shown that you cannot isolate yourself. It's borderless. How do you cooperate together would be very important. So that's clearly second area, understanding the new world order and the rising strategic importance of India. India will benefit enormously as the world distances from China. That is the work I do, geopolitical work myself. The third one is much more different. All of these technologies have huge side effects, like the potent drug. We need to understand the side effects, both in terms of our daily lives and digital addiction is real. And digital addiction is an addiction of mind, not body, like gambling or mental disease. It's very hard. There is a very primitive technology to how do you take the mental state and change in that one. So to me, understanding the side effects and making sure you are not overusing it to get into a problem like, like the painkiller drug abuse, for example, because you can't control yourself. To me, understanding side effects is very key. The roommate nation is the one that I talked about. But more importantly, the next generation of people are bonding with virtual entities and virtual worlds than real world. You have a virtual girlfriend or a virtual friend. You talk to them. That's pretty interesting. And it's very large scale. We don't realize there are 650 million Chinese living in virtual world with more happiness than in the physical world. Now, what happens to society? All the institutions, do they, are they relevant anymore? Family as an institution, religion as an institution, education as an institution, government as an institution. 
I think that scenario, I have a book coming out, by the way, called Seven Side Effects of the Internet Age, Dark Side of the Internet Age. And after writing and researching, uh, I'm more scared about the future that way, even though I'm an optimist by and large. But, but the world is changing so dramatically. So there's the new global architecture, technology, and the impact of technology on society at large in general, but as well as in our personal lives, corporate lives, anything that we do. Thank you for inviting me. It was a pleasure.